Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to come here and talk to you about my, my research subject, migratory birds. But before we get into subject, I would like to start by asking you a question. Who here would like to spend the winter on that tropical beach, particularly in that cabin on the hill? <laughs> That'll be a nice location for winter, right? But what if you have to run all the way there to the tropics? And I don't mean walking or jogging, I mean running as fast as you can the whole way there. <laughs> but that's not even the worst part, wait. The worst part is that once you make it to that cabin, you realize there's a lot of other travelers who, like you, run all the way there and also want to stay there. And they won't listen to reason. So the only way is to fight for your right to stay on that cabin. And then you have to defend it for seven months, and then you have to run all the way back here. So, it's a pretty rough, rough deal. That beach and that cabin may not seem that enticing after that. So, I want to split this in two questions. First, how the birds are able to do that, which is a close analogy to what birds do. How are they able to do that year after year? And the second part is why are they doing that? First, is, let's go to the first question. How do birds manage to do this? How do they manage to do this trip? They have a lot of amazing adaptations that I, I find fascinating. There's too many to, to fit into this talk, but I'll just tell you three main ones that I find very, very interesting. First one is their breathing efficiency. If we started to run as fast as we can, we'll soon find out we are out of breath. That probably is our own fault for not making as much exercise as we should. But <laughs> not even that we are hampered by, the, by our lungs, which are not that efficient. Of every breath you take, only about 80% of the oxygen you breathe is used. The rest just gets ex excelled back without participating in any gas exchange. All the gas exchange that you realize occurs in the alveoli at the end of the, of the bronchi in the lungs. The birds have a completely different design to our lungs which makes them way more efficient and I think way cool. The lung, it's not so much like a root, like ours, it's more like a grill, like a radiator. And while in our lungs, the air comes in one way and goes out the same way, which makes them very inefficient. On birds, the air comes one way, goes inside the lung in one direction, and then comes out in this or wrong type. So that makes, it their oxygen. that makes the gas exchange extremely efficient. While we, are 80, we only take advantage of 80% of the oxygen, the birds make use of nearly 100% of all the oxygen they breathe. And that reflects on their lower uh, need to breathe. Like even when they do way more extenuous exercise, at a resting pace, we breathe once for every three heartbeats, so your heart, heart beats three times and then you take one breath. But birds only need to breathe once every 7.5 heartbeats. So they are, their lungs are way, way more efficient than ours, and that allow, allows them to, to travel vast, like vast distances without running out of breath so fast. Another thing, another adaptation that I find very interesting is that migration takes guts, a lot of guts. Why? Because before you start your trip, you have to fuel it somehow. And that fuel comes in the way of fat. Before migrating, a bird eats a lot of, like it, it eats a lot. It eats two to three times what he regularly eats or what he, he or she will regularly eat. Imagine eating two breakfasts, two dinners, two lunches for about a month. And not only eating them, because probably we can do that. No, it won't be healthy, but we could probably do it. But absorbing all the nutrients and transforming in transforming them into muscle and into fat. That will, that's another way that, that birds are really efficient. Here you can see these charts. These are from, from a paper from Piersma. They are not mine. But I find it very interesting that you see this bird whose mass before start feeding was 140 grams. In just four weeks, it increments its mass by, by about 80 grams, which is almost 50% of its, ma its mass. It will be like me putting 30 kilos in just three weeks. And most of that fat goes in mass, sorry, most of that mass goes into fat, like you can see in this chart. A lot of that is fat, but 
Another thing, another thing that they put out of muscle is in their pectoral muscles because they use them for, for the flight. But that's not the most, most incredible part. The most incredible part is that as they are putting that extra resources or those resources into building the fat and, and muscle resources, they start decreasing their, like, they achieve a peak on the nutrients they can take and then they start decreasing their gut size in allocating those resources once they have, they have them into building the, the fat and the muscles. But that's not really the most amazing part. As they are flying, they are burning the fat that they use and they are using the, the fat that they store, sorry. If they start running low on fat, it's like running out of fuel in your car, so you don't want that to happen in the middle of a trip. They can only use certain a little bit of the muscle mass to fuel their trip because they are using it constantly, so they don't want to burn that. What do they do? They start burning the mass of the intestines at the stomach. So while they are flying, if they are running out of fuel, they start metabolizing that protein to fuel their flight. They, fuel, they are so efficient in, in this that after a long trip, some birds are completely unable to eat. They may land on a new location, but their stomach and their intestines are so atrophied. <coughs> sorry, that they are unable to eat. They have to wait a couple days until their muscles are the, that they are not using anymore because they already migrated, transform into intestines again, and then they can start eating again. Imagine having such a flexibility in your body. It's, it blows my mind how, how much of their, their resources they can allocate at almost at the right timings. And the final thing that I wanted to talk about is about their orientation and navigation. Uh, they have an amazing sense of orientation and navigation. Orientation is your sense of direction, where is north, where is south, and navigation is your, your position on a given map, like where you are. Imagine we were dropped in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, say here, in a raft with plenty of food or, or, and, and we know how to sail and everything, but without a map and a compass. Most of us will never find our way back home. And back in the 50s and 60s, when you could get the permit to do these experiments, that's exactly what people did to a lot of birds. They would pick them up here in Hawaii or in, in Midway, then fly them by plane, blindfolded, blindfolded into a location where they have never been, say, in on the coast of Washington, and then wait to see if they found their way back. Surprisingly, all the birds find their way back, and this experiment was repeated with several species in several locations, and they always find their way back. So that tells us that they not only they have very keen internal senses of orientation and navigation. It's not that they learn the routes, which they do, but that's not their main navigation or orientation mechanism. They have internal compasses that tell them where to go. And not only they have one internal compass, they have four different kinds of internal compasses. We only have one at the best. We can tell where we are based on the, on the sun position. So, uh, sometimes, anyways, but birds can do that with the sun. Birds can orient themselves with the stars, with the magnetic field of the Earth, and with the direction of the light, the sunlight. Not with the sun position, but with the direction of the sunlight, with a polar, it's called polarized light. So they have four different kinds of compasses, which means that even in the worst conditions, even if it's a foggy night, they, won't, they are very unlikely to get lost. And they also have three different kinds of mental maps. Well, we only have one most of the time, we have a visual map. Birds also have the visual map, but they also have an auditory map and an olfactory map. So they use these extremely keen senses of orientation to navigate in their extremely long location, sorry, extremely long migrations. And that's what I want to talk about too. Some of the most amazing migrations that are, are on Earth. Uh, again, not from my birds, this is data from other people. I just get to talk about it. Uh, this is a Bar-tailed goldwit. Oh, oh no, this is a site, yeah. He's the fastest migrant on Earth. They breed in Alaska, you can see there, in the north. And they spend the winter in, in New Zealand. That's about 10,000 kilometers. They make that flight non-stop in just eight days. That's 10,000 kilometers. That's probably the average 
of any of us driving in one year. Think of all the driving you did since 2015, and they just fly it in, in eight days. I find that really amazing. But as amazing as it is, it's not by any means the longest migration we have on this planet. That ground goes to this bird, the Arctic Tern. They breed in Greenland, and at summer's end, they fly south all the way to the South Pole, where they spend five months, and then they fly up all the way up, again, all the way up. In a single year, they travel 80,000 kilometers. Think of how much you have driven since 2000, 2008, will be now, 2000, yeah, 2008, and that's what they do in one year, just a single year. So these are really amazing feats of the natural world. But now the other question. Why, why to migrate? What are the benefits? Why are they crossing the globe and, and crossing the, the Pacific Ocean? What's the benefit of that? In order for migration to exist, there must be a direct benefit. Otherwise, the, it won't happen on, on nature. Migration usually entails a two-way trip between two locations that offer two different resources. That's the key. There are two different resources that birds use in their migration. Let's take the example of Canada. Sorry, and those, mi those resources that the birds use are usually in a cyclic pattern, in a cyclic predictable pattern, which usually happens on the form of seasons. Take the example of Canada, which has a very seasonal climate. And as you know, as beautiful as the Canad Canadian summer is, it has a lot of bugs. Every, like, a lot of mosquitoes and other bugs that just come out in the summer. This provides a lot of food for thousands of birds. Canada's boreal forest has been justly called the, the, the bird nursery of the continent because millions and millions of birds breed on the boreal forest in Canada. Why? Because there's a sudden influx of, of insects that provide not only food for themselves, but food for their offspring. Another advantage of coming all the way here to reproduce like these birds is that there's less predators, especially compared to the tropics. There's not that many reptiles. In the tropics, even spiders will prey on, 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 on fledglings. There's not that problem here. And there's a lot more mammals and lizards that could prey on your eggs. Incidentally, I took this picture while I was collaborating with a project in Peru, in the Amazon. I took this picture because it was close to a nest that we were monitoring of tropical birds. And in this picture, you can still see the chick if you pay close, close attention. <laughs> the the plunging. You can see a little bulge on the body of the snake there on the middle. That's the that's the nestling that was eaten from that nest. You, the other nestling was also in this picture, but you cannot see it. It's on the back of the snake. <laughs> so there is a lot of predators in the tropics. So that's one advantage of making coming here, coming all the way here to reproduce. A lot of food, minus the predators, gives you a lot of healthy offspring. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's seen on the birds for migrate, migration. So with Canada being such a seasonal climate, it's not surprising that most of, it, it, most of its birds, most of Canadian birds are migratory. These are pictures of some Canadian birds. You can see that they come in all shapes and sizes. And of those, these ones migrate south, all those migrate south come summer end, and those ones stay here year-round. The adaptations that they use to stay in the hard Canadian winter all year-round are, are, are also very fascinating, but they are not the subject of this talk, so that will be for somebody else to, to cover. Back to my Canadian migratory birds. As you saw, there's a lot of species that are migratory. But it's not only biodiversity, it's also biomass. That it's, it's, but most of Canadian birds are migratory, and that makes for most of the bi Canadian bird biomass. In that chart, you can see the resident birds. In, along five, the resident birds breeding in a plot of 10 hectares along six decades. This are, is the biomass of migratory birds in that same plot. Oops. There we go. So you can see it's. By far, most of bird biomass in Canada is migratory birds. But there's another trend that you can see on this graph. As you can see, 
migratory birds are declining, while resident species here at the bottom remain more or less stable. Why is that? Why are migratory species declining? Well, to get to that question, we need to visualize and understand the, the migratory species in their full life cycle. There's a breeding ground here in Canada, and at the summer ends, there's a fall migration. Where, and then they go to the wintering grounds, somewhere south, where they will spend seven months. And then after those seven months, they come back. Mortality occurs in all stages of this cycle. Uh, they die during migration at the wintering grounds and during, during the breeding grounds. But here's the, the, here's the kicker. So far, most of the research on migratory birds has been done in the breeding grounds. There are still a lot of questions to answer about the ecology, the behavior, and the survival of weird birds in their wintering grounds. And that's, that's where my research is focusing, on the wintering grounds. My research aims to answer some of those interrogations. So if I'm going to study birds in their wintering grounds in, in the American continent, where should I go? Here you can see the Canadian uh, Sorry, you, here you can see the distribution of migratory birds during summer. You can see that some parts of Canada have over 200 migratory birds, sorry, over 200 species breeding, not only migratory, all sorts of birds breeding during summer. But come winter, where do they go? Here you can see the distribution of migratory birds during winter. You can see that most of them go to Mexico. Some of them go to Central America and, Colombia and South America, but the bulk of them is in Mexico. Mexico has the highest biodiversity on migratory birds, but also has a long history of habitat degradation. In this map, you can see that some parts of Mexico, has le like here, have less than 15% of their natural cover remaining. Some other parts are doing better in green, where they have close to all their, their natural cover in, still intact, but still, almost 13% of Mexico's surface is agriculture. How does this affect the survival and the wintering ecology of migratory birds? To my surprise, there's very little research done in this subject. Most of it has been done in chain grown coffee plantation, which is really cool, but chain grown coffee is only like 5% of the agricultural surface. So this 13% only about 5% of that is coffee. So it's a very little percentage of agriculture that it's actually coffee in Mexico. The other 95%, there's really no work on how it affects their survival or their, or their ecology. So that's where I'm going. First, my research aims to answer three questions related to this subject. How do birds use agriculture compared to natural habitats? Are they using it through the winter? Do they use it at all? They may not use it. Uh, or are they just commuting through it? We'll see. My second, questions that, that, that my second question that I, I am aiming to answer is, where do individuals wintering the different habitat in Mexico come from? Well, we know they come somewhere from North America, but is it from the States? Is it from Canada, Northern Canada, Southern Canada? We'll find out. And the most important question, the, the, the big one, does the use of the different habitats Assuming they use agriculture, has an effect on their survival? Do birds in different habitats have the same survival? We'll see. Well, first I have to choose my study site. We know that Mexico has the highest biodiversity of ma migrant uh, songbirds, so, of migrant birds, sorry, so I choose my field site in Mexico. Conveniently close to Puerto Vallarta, <laughs> and conveniently <laughs> close <laughs> to the which I showed you in the beginning. That's actually a picture from one of my field sites, so not too bad, not too bad. <laughs> Somebody's going to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the second thing after I choose my study site is my study species. I would really like to study all the species. If you're going to focus on such, such uh, specific questions as habitat use and survival, you need to focus. And I choose this model species, the yellow warbler. That little guy. It's a nine gram bird, it's about this big. And despite its size, in, a, in any given year, it will travel 5,000 ki 
kilometers twice a year, but once going south and once going north. Its breeding range, you can see it here in, in orange, and its wintering range, it's here in blue, Latin America. As most migratory birds, its summer ecology is widely studied, and a lot of things are known about his summer ecology, but almost nothing during winter. Uh, there are some studies on their different habitats used during winter, but still, my first field season, my first uh, time in, in studying them, I had to determine which habitats they were using. And we found them mainly in three habitats. We found them in riparian, which is the forest along the river edges. Huh? We found them in coastal lagoon vegetation, which is a combination of dry scrub and mangrove. You can see the dry scrub at the top. It's very seasonal environment too, and it's dry at this time of up during most of the winter. And this green stripe is the mangrove, where the birds, where we found most of the birds in that habitat. And to my surprise, they also use agriculture uh, in large numbers. Uh, this is a chili pepper plantation. It's an actual picture of one of my field sites. And we found them in, in agriculture a lot too. So now that we know where they are, how do birds use agriculture compared to natural habitats? First, how do they use natural habitats? Do they stay in the same place the whole, the whole winter? Do they move around? We'll see. My field, methods, my field methodology was fairly straightforward. We banded birds from January to May, from 2011 to 2014. And in that period, we banded over 200 birds. You can see their fashionable bands on their legs there for visual identification purposes. And we banded across the three different habitats, over 200 birds, but a subset of those 60 birds were equipped with a radio tag, which is this, uh, it's a, like the size of a jelly bean. It weighs about 0.3 grams, 0 0.3 grams, and it allows me to track a bird through its movements uh, with the aid of a telemetry uh, device. You can see, Maybe you can see the antenna sticking out here. Um, with that telemetry, we, we were able to plot their habitat use during winter. Ah, here. Here's some territories of the birds that we found in riparian habitat in the, in, the, in the rivers. You can see that some birds stay the whole, pretty much the whole winter in the same tree. This is a single tree. The bird tree like that tree and stay there most of the winter, if not all the winter. Some other birds may not be so lucky to have such a nice tree and wander a bit more, like those, the red one and the orange, orange one. They still stay on a relatively small area through the summer, like say the size of a block or the size of a, of a large building. But the, in natural habitats, they pretty much stay in the same place with some variation on how they use that habitat. Sorry, how they use that, that space. What do they do in agriculture? They do the same. Uh, we found some birds that, like this one, really like a tree that was dividing the fields, and they will stay there the whole winter in that tree, for like venturing a bit out, but not much. And some other birds were not so lucky to have such a nice tree again, and they will actually use the crops. They will spend the winter foraging in the crops, and that was surprising to me because they, from a, from if it wasn't for the telemetry we will have never known, because these are crops like corn and sorghum. And if you have been on a corn field, you know it's very densely packed, and you really don't know what's going on other than in the edges. So plenty of times we'll be getting the signal from the middle of a corn field or a chili pepper field, and be like, oh, the bird just died, let's go and, and, and pick it up. And then we'll get to it, and then the bird will just clutch. And that, that happened many times, and to my surprise, they were, day after day, they were using chili peppers, sorghum, and corn fields uh, to meet their daily requirements. Another thing that I found interesting is that different crops, crops sorry, have different things to offer. Uh, let's see, the next slide has it. Look, this is a sorghum field, and this is a chili pepper field, and they will feed there. But at dusk, they will go to the mango plantation, which is right there on, at the very top with some, some dots. Those are, those are roosting locations. So they will feed during the day in some crops, and then at night they will flock to the, to the mango plantation. 
So different crops have different value for the birds. And not only for my study species, at dusk, if I was standing next to this field, I would see hundreds and hundreds of birds from many different species, migratory birds, leave the crop and then go and roost in the mango plantation, which I thought was really interesting because there's few, few records of birds using agricultural habitats through the winter. And this is not pretty habitat, I have to say. Like, the beach was really nice and everything, but I had to work here also all the time. <laughs> and the birds are here too. Uh, they, they use this for foraging all through the winter, which is something that was a bit surprising for me to find out. So, what crops do they use the most? They like sorghum. I have to say it's organic sorghum. Uh, not because people are looking to buy organic sorghum, but, but because it's cattle feed. That sorghum is grown to feed cattle. So it has such a low value that people just doesn't bother spraying it with anything. But because of that, it provided habitat for a lot of birds. So low value sorghum was very useful for these birds. Another crop that they liked was corn. Chili peppers, to my surprise, they, they really like the chili peppers too. And as I said, mango. Mango plantations were used for feeding for some birds, but for more, most birds for roosting. Some other crops that were also present in the area, but they were not so, they were not so liked by the birds were cucumbers and tomatoes. They rarely venture into those. And pineapples and papayas also. So, now we know that they do use agriculture through the winter, and we know that they are using it for feeding, but where do birds at winter in Mexico come from? Do, where do individuals winter in the different habitats come from? The first question is, how do you track a 9 gram bird at a continental scale? <laughs> it's, it's a tricky question because some of the studies that I showed you, the, remember the ones with the birds crossing the Atlantic and everything? and the Pacific, sorry. Those ones use satellite tags, which are really, really nice devices that give you a satellite location of where your bird is. But the lightest one weighs 3.5 grams. It's way too heavy for my birds, because ideally the tags should be less than 5% of the bird's mass. And these ones are over 30% of the bird mass, so definitely not doable, as nice as it will be. So these ones are out of the question. There's another type of tax which we're also using in, in some of the studies that I showed you early. These ones are called geolocators. They track the length of the day. You attach them to a bird and then let the bird go. And through that, and then ca capture it ne next year. Through that period, the geolocator records the length of every day. And by measuring, once you capture the bird, you measure how long the day was. You can more or less plot where, in which latitude it was that that bird spent that time. These ones are lighter, they are way lighter, they are really nice, but they are at 0 0.45 grams, which is just at the boundary, it's 5% it's of my, my bird. Some birds are lighter, some birds are 7 grams, some are, are a bit heavy, heavier, but it's just at the boundary. But I didn't use them because I'm very interested in survival. And if this has a negative effect on their survival, then my results will be biased. So these ones were also out of the question for my birds because they are too small. So I have to, we have to use hydrogen isotopes. Which, what are hydrogen isotopes? I'm going to make a small parenthesis and explain what are hydrogen isotopes. Well, we know hydrogen is present in the Earth's atmosphere, mostly in the form of water. There's regular hydrogen. Well, isotopes are like flavors. Let's think of isotopes as, as flavors. There's regular hydrogen, which is, let's call it vanilla flavor. It's a regular one. And there's deuterium. No, sorry, the regular hydrogen, hydrogen has one proton. And the deuterium has one proton and one neutron. It's a little bit different. It's, let's just call it strawberry for, to keep it in mind. So these two atoms of, the two atoms of any of this hydrogen can combine with oxygen, and then they form water. Right? The water that has deuterium, sorry, the water that is done with the regular hydrogen, the vanilla, is just regular water. Well, the water that has deuterium is called heavy water because it, it actually has more mass because it has one extra neutron. 
So, most of the water evaporation in Earth occurs next to the equator because it has most of the solar radiation, right? When that water evaporates and forms a cloud, that cloud has both heavy water and regular water. But what happens as the cloud moves out, moves further north, like the clouds that we see today, at some point we're in the equator? Well, the heavy water, because it's heavier, rains first. So that, that allows us to analyze the proportion between regular water and heavy water, giving each area a distinct proportion between those two types of water. I, I hope, is that clear? Yeah? All good? Okay, so what does, that, what does this have to do with birds anyways? Well, birds grow their feathers at predictable times at the end of the summer. When they grow those feathers, those feathers retain the isotopic signature of the place where they were grown. So if I capture a bird in Mexico, by, looking, by analyzing the composition of the hydrogen in those feathers, I can determine where that feather was grown. And where, what did I find out? I took 200 feathers. Let's see where those birds came from. Most of the birds that I captured in Mexico were coming from northern Canada. As you can see, the three lightest color bands. It's pretty much all Canada. And very few of the birds, only like 15, of my 200 birds were coming from the States or further south. So most of the Canadian birds are indeed wintering in Mexico. But here comes a really interesting part. Birds wintering in natural habitats were from different parts of birds wintering in agricultural habitats. Here you can see, these are the birds wintering in the farmland. And you can see that most of the birds are from this region and some of the, of the darker regions. While in the natural habitats, most of the birds were from the far north, mostly from like the Northwest Territories and, and Alaska. And farmland birds were more like from the, 12, from the lower provinces. So that was very interesting because if there was a negative effect on survival on farmland, you know which populations will be affected. So now the next question. Does the use of agricultural habitat has an effect on survival? To my surprise, it doesn't. It, they have a good survival in agricultural habitat here, as they do in riparian. You can see that monthly survival, it's about 96% for adult males and about 94% for adult females. Uh, sorry, I should explain this. These are adult males in, in dark blue and the adult females in dark red and young males in dark, in light blue, sorry. And you can see that the worst habitat was the dry scrub mangrove. This could be because it's drier, there's less food. Uh, I'm still not sure of why that, that one was the lowest survival and agriculture had such high survival compared to agriculture. Could be because agriculture has uh, this is a very seasonal climate, as Canada, but this one is more to do with dry season and wet season. And agriculture is irrigated all through the year. So that may be a, an incentive that will be a, a, an, a, an advantage for birds wintering in agriculture, that there's more, more, agri more water and therefore more bugs. Another thing that may be causing the, that agriculture has the same survival as riparian habitat is because there's less predators. Of all the birds that I banded, I only had two predation events that confirmed that I just found the radio with a bunch of feathers around, so it was pretty sure that something killed them. Uh, and both events happened in riparian habitat. And on our point counts, we found four different types of hawks that feed on songbirds in riparian habitat. While in agriculture, there's none of them because there, there's no, no, no habitat for those hawks. So that may be driving that, but I was very glad to see that agriculture is not really that different from, from... Survival in agriculture is not that different from riparian habitat. Another thing that may be influencing this is that this is relatively low 
uh, low technology or low density agriculture. So with that, knowing that survival is the same in natural habitats, we know a bit more about the wintering period and we can assume that if the bird population, migratory birds population are declining, maybe most of the mortality is occurring during migration, not so much during the wintering grounds. But that will be the subject of a different research. I was very happy to find that agriculture had similar survival because of a previous speaker in this, in this conference series, Sirius Carp, found that uh, agriculture in low intensity had similar value for biodiversity. It's different than survival. That is, there was an equal amount of species wintering in, in agricultural habitat, low yield agriculture, than in forest. Different types of species, but still similar numbers of species. But my study provides support, further support for this because not only are they found there, they are also doing well. So I was very happy to see that this, this is shaping on that direction. And I'd like to finish by just saying a couple things that you can do to help the birds because their population are still declining. Uh, when you're buying products from Latin America, such as bananas or mangoes, choose organic when available. And if not, it's okay. They are not, as I mentioned, they still have value for, for, uh, for migratory birds. But if you can eat organic, it's good for you and good for the birds. And same for some North American products, particularly corn. Try to avoid pineapple and alfalfa. Those are really of no use for the birds. Uh, I really stop eating as much pineapple as I, I used to after I spent some time in pineapple plantations in Costa Rica. And they are really, really barren for, for, for birds. Um, a lot of birds died on, on migration because of collision with buildings. That's actually a, a big problem. And if you can make your windows more visible, there's all sorts of help on, on, on how to do this on the internet, like with stickers, with uh, some dazzling, uh, like tasslers and stuff like that. And that would help to reduce collisions a lot. Also by turning off your, your lights when you are not using them in peak migration periods. And also please keep your cats indoors. If you have any cats, cats really get, get a, a kick out of hunting birds and they, it's debatable how many birds they kill, but they, they are thought to be a problem. And it doesn't hurt to keep, keep cats indoors if you can, to help the birds. They are already having a hard time. And before I finish, I'd like to make a, an, an, a commercial an ad. <laughs> I'm also an amateur photographer, and this picture is must feature is featured on the Answer Science Exposed Contest. Uh, if you want, you can check it out on, online, uh, Science Exposed, and, and you can vote for your favorite picture. If you like this talk, please vote for this one. If not, just vote for the one of the other ones. They are also very good, too. <laughs> uh, but if you have a chance, check it out, Science Exposed. There's a lot of cool projects and a lot of cool pictures. And with that, I'd like to also thank first institutions that have made this research pro possible from both Mexico and Canada, Simon Fraser, Center for Wildlife, Wildlife Ecology, Environment Canada, and CONACYT, which is the equivalent of NSERC in Mexico. And also, very importantly, I would like to uh, thank the volunteers who helped me to do all the hard field work. And also, I should, have, uh, I should have included a picture of my advisor, but I should thank my advisor, David Green, who has been great support, and my wife, Anna Drake, who also has been a great support. But I didn't put pictures on the presentation, my mistake. With that, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have.